Hello, uh, myself Asim. Uh, I, this is me. Uh, some socials about me. I was a, I've been a security engineer for the past five years. I recently started my own company. You can see here. Uh, it's called Secure My Org, uh, a cyber security consulting company. Uh, before we start, uh, one second. Sorry. Give, give me a minute. I think there was some. I think I was not connected to the internet, so I didn't load the latest one. Cool, I think. Uh, and this is about me, uh, I'll continue. So before we begin, uh, I have an announcement. I have a few stickers, so if you want it for your laptop, it's kept here. And these are two variants that are there, so if you want, you can pick, up it, pick it up later as well. Uh, I've kept it here for you. Uh, let's talk about the outline. So I don't know if you guys have heard about uh, the golden circle, like what, why, and how, the things that we do. And I'll talk about why we, why we are doing a security champions leaderboard, why is it important, and how it helps the, shape the security culture of an organization, and how, as a security engineer, it would help you in your day-to-day -day life, which would make it a lot easier. There are a few case studies which talk about why it is important, uh, the first one being a fintech company, and the other one being a data exposure that happened for the Pegasus Airlines. Then we'll talk about the most painful thing for a security engineer, and I'll continue with that. Uh, yeah. So why, how, what? So first we'll tackle the why, why uh, security leaderboard is important in your organization, how we did it, how we executed it in my previous org that was rippling, and what was the result of that. So let's uh, tackle the why through a case study. It's a, about a Singaporean fintech company. Uh, this company is a technical partner for one of the upcoming banks in a Southeast Asian company. They have pretty good tech practices. The founder is a ex-Googler who worked for a very long time at Google and knows the ins and outs. He knows how to handle the technical debt and all those kinds of things. So when I was uh, working with them, AWS org was very neatly created with separation of concerns for their uh, test environment, their staging environment, the production environment. All those were very neatly done. Everything was being deployed through Polumi, although I have seen at companies which are even like product companies which are in four to five years old, they don't have IAC in place, but this company, even before launching their product, they had IAC in place. All the work was, workload was on Kate, so everything was optimized, load shedding, all those things were there. They also had the practice of keeping a mono repo. The idea behind that was that everyone should know the whole code base in the organization, so it's easier for them to work on different kinds of things. If you see the last point, that is where things started to look not so good, where people had access to DB credits. And so we, we were hired as a remote security partner for them. So uh, like my team was tasked to build the seam, their perimeter security, security policies, setting up their cloud security automation, posture management, all those kinds of things. So what we do initially was we did a first week evaluation and we came with a plan of action and we identified some of the loopholes that were there. The tech culture was good. They didn't have a lot of technical debt, and the way they were going forward, it would not have accumulated a lot because the practices were really good. But there was a severe lack of knowledge as to what are the secure practices. For example, they had the AWS security, uh, the secrets manager was there, but people were still hard coding secrets. They were sharing secrets in the Slack messages. All those things was being done, even though they had like technology to tackle it. So it was not a technical problem, rather it was a cultural problem or the way it should be done, they were not aware of it. So I would rather state it as an awareness problem rather a technical problem. 
So apart from doing the technical things, uh, the technical solutions, security solutions like Seam, Cloud Security, all those things, you also created a custom security onboarding checklist for them. What it was like, it uh, whenever uh, employee, uh, engineer, or uh, maybe a non-technical person was onboarded, we had a checklist uh, on Jira where people had to do certain things. So I'm currently talking about the custom checklist for an engineer. So for example, they had if they had to do uh, there was an internally self-hosted private bin that we had set up. Uh, this is how the private bin looked like. It's a open source uh, project. You can host it on your own app on your personal use as well. So it has features like burn after reading, expire the paste expires after some time. There's a password also. And the key is in the URL itself, so you don't have to send a key separately. And the data itself goes encrypted to the web server. So if, even if you like read the HTTP packets or HTTPS packets, you would not see the actual data going. Or even if the server gets compromised without the URL, that can be decoded. So the first thing in the checklist was to share a secret using this internal hosted bin so that they know if they have to share some secret or some data to uh, internally, they wouldn't use Slack directly, rather they would create a private bin URL and that would be shared across the organization. The second and third thing was to create a POC kind of thing where they would be using a AWS Secrets Manager so that they know how to write the code, uh, what the what are different APIs. So that was also a like, DIY thing and it took around 10 to 15 minutes to just complete all these things and it was manually verified. There was no automation to check all these things. but. At least at the scale the company was like 50 to 60 engineers, it was good enough that everyone knew how to use these things. And it was very easy later on to remove the security debt, I would say. We also created secure defaults for their IAC. So they were using Pulumi, but again, Pulumi or Terraform, they don't have by default secure controls. So you can create S3 public bucket because they are basically an, uh, kind of a wrapper for all the options that are there in the AWS resources or G Cloud resources or whatever cloud you're using. So created secure default modules for them so that, like let's say a person has to create a bucket on AWS S3, instead of using the default Pulumi, uh, Pulumi what do you say, uh, language or pa the parser, they would have this module, they can import it and they can just set some of the options and then that would go through code and get deployed. Uh, let's come to the second case study. Pegasus Airlines exposes 6.5 terabytes of data. It, so Pegasus is a Turkish low-cost airline, and it's one of the leading low-cost airlines. I mean, uh, while I was at Istanbul a few months back, I took this flight. And they have over 100 destinations, so you can easily understand the scale of uh, operations that they are doing and the data that they are handling. What happened was, so there's this company, Safety De Detectives. They are a cybersecurity team. They, are, they were doing this web mapping project where they were constantly like scraping websites and finding secrets from them and then verifying whether those secrets are valid or not. And that's where they, they stumbled upon this uh, AWS access key uh, secret and ID both of them. And eventually they found that that was the electronic flight bag, uh, the S3 bucket that had sensitive data for Pegasus Airlines. Over 3.2 million sensitive files were there. In total, I remember there was, I think, 29 million files or something. Out of them, like a huge chunk of data that was sensitive. Again, I, I wouldn't say that Pegasus Airlines didn't have a security team or they didn't have the capabilities to protect the bucket. It, from what it looked like, it looked like that something missed out in the security process. There was some leak in the process, and that's how it got into the public uh, realm. Talking about the securing cloud, I try to write a small ebook kind of thing. It's a practical steps and strategies that we have been using to open so and using an open source tool, including some of the cloud native tools as well that help you create a secure cloud. And if you see the architecture diagram, it's a very simple thing. We have Prowler for cloud security. There's a cloud custodian for uh, auto remediation pipelines. And then there's Vazu for Seam. And all of these data can easily be ingested into your AWS security hub, or it can be sent as a notification to your different uh, alerting tools. You can download it from here. Uh, I'll share the link of the slides later so you can have a look on it. Let's talk about the conclusions and that would also conclude the why of this part. So in both of these cases, there was a lack of security awareness. In the first one, there was an OPSEC pitfall where the Singaporean client, they even though they had the resources, they had the technical capabilities, the awareness of using them was not there and that's how the 
the mess up happened whereas in the second one there were no there were lack of strong security processes uh, in the pegasus airlines case now this question i would like to ask for all the people who are here what is the most painful thing for any security engineer around the globe you would have worked with different teams you would have worked with internally in your teams so anyone would like to point out to something uh, like you can go here you can also poll here if you want yeah man uh, you wanted to say something yeah that, that's a good one secret management is a bit cumbersome and the organization starts growing anyone else yeah <laughs> that's the most horrible thing i would say <laughs> cool that's also a good one Uh, like getting work done from other teams. Yep. I see that one is still higher right now. Anyone else? Have you been in a situation where you know that this is a P0, but you have to fight for it that it's a P0 and not a P2 or P3? Has anyone been in those situations? Okay, <laughs> I think everyone understands the pain. And if you see here, the, yeah, the 71% of people, I don't know if it's like, there's, there's a lot this is a small sample size but i also did a poll on my linkedin and almost 76 people voted and out of them 64% of people were that getting bugs fixed from other team was the most painful thing for a, as a security engineering job and that is what we try to like target through creating a security champions program internally cool so what's the real issue behind getting bugs not being fixed by other team from my experience and that's not a very long it's a only five year experience but working at different organizations small and large i've seen that security has always been seen as a blocker uh, for a lot of devs devops team and all it's felt that okay now they have come there's a jira ticket now we have to solve it instead of actually working it out in the very first they have a sense of ignoring security in some sense or if they find a jira ticket it feels that they are not productive enough instead of shipping out more features they are stuck in doing some security work that's the general mindset what i believe is security is a shared responsibility it's not that only the security team should be working on the security issues because security team alone can't do anything unless they have the support of the developers and the devops team who are deploying those pipelines again respecting the sla and solving above issues in real time that would be an ideal world where it gets solved easily coming to that the the this there's this term called shift left culture where people are trying to move security as close to the devs as possible the benefit of this is that if security is baked into very early on into the security it helps uh, a lot less issues come into the final production pipelines and that's what uh, uh, there's an example that we used to have in gojek when i was a senior security engineer so we had these rfcs shared by the developer teams where they used to have this architecture designs and also the kind of technologies they were using for example uh, there was this uh, password management system that they were building internally and they were using md5 instead of sha256 and then because the design was shared 4 months prior to when it was actually being launched we were able to give them suggestions instead of md5 they can use sha256 now this helped them that if let's say later on some data breach happened somewhere the md5 hashes would have been easily cracked as compared to sha256 so one of the incidents was already been mitigated because it was communicated to us very early on so that's what the shift left is all about where you move security early to the dev developer pipeline and this is the famous quote that you have seen security is everyone's job now how do we achieve this how do we achieve that everyone is a shared stakeholder into security now just a quick question if i ask you to hey i'll give you some money and you would have to go out in the field and run for 30 minutes how much money would you ask from me you going to pay me to do that oh you are going to run for free for 30 minutes 100 bucks yeah, like 100 20 bucks 20 what about one hour if i ask you to run for one hour in a scorching heat of sun if i give you 1000 dollars 1000 dollars would work what if i tell you i'll get you done all this for free and you would be happily doing it would you believe me okay 
let's say now invite you for a game of soccer. Would you be happy to come to it? And you would be running for one and a half hours, that too, for free. So it's all about the mindset. Where I was asking you to run in a field, you felt, no, I won't be doing it. I might take some money off it. But if I tell you and invite you to a game, you might be very much into it, and you would be giving your full to get it done. Similarly, we tried to gamify the security issues in a company where we try to build, instead of asking them to fix it, we try to gamify the solution by giving points to people, giving, making a public leaderboard so that when they fix something, they get some points. There, there was no tangible benefit out of it. They were not getting Amazon gift cards or something. But eventually, we thought of giving that as well. But initial, it was only that, OK, have a competitive leaderboard where people get points to do something good in favor of security. Uh, let's see the leaderboard. Uh, so it's a public long-running leaderboard across the organization. And again, it's not more of a technical change. I coded it myself. But the implementation part or the cultural change was the major thing here. So how it works is there's this long-running leaderboard. And anyone outside the security team, if they contribute to the security of the organization, for example, let's say they identify a P0, or they fix a P0 or P1 or whatever or they flag some issues that, hey, we got this report, or we are seeing this data getting leaked. So the security team or anyone else in the, in the whole organization can give them kudos for that. Uh, so this is how the leaderboard looks like. I had to mask all of data. So if you see, it, it was a full-fledged product. So on this right, if you say there's this all-time thing, this is the all-time leaderboard. You can click on it. It's a drop-down. You would get the weekly leaderboard, monthly leaderboard. There's a ranking, the top rank, the second, the third, and then there's a searchable list on the bottom. There's a security, the kudos feed as well on the right, where you get who got what kudos, what was the date, who gave them, all those things were there. There's a comment in every kudo, like why they are getting this particular kudos. And for each of these profiles, you can see all the kudos that they have got. Uh, let's talk about some of the salient features of it. So there are levels, as in any other game, there are levels. The same way there are levels in this also. So as you grow in points, you gain a certain level. For each level, we created some stickers that only the security team could give. And you would be bragging. You would get bragging rights by putting those stickers on your laptop, all those kinds of things. So ease of use was very important because no one would go to a particular URL to give kudos. So we created a Slack command so that they can easily give it. Continued appreciation was the way that, OK, we need to, because we are doing a cultural change, we need to put it again and again. So we, uh, we posted the weekly leaderboard on our Slack channels. There's a feed page and there's a profile page also. So people can just share the profile page and brag about it as well. This is the profile page. You see there is a person's photo. And this photo was, again, taken from the company's directory. The level 10 is there. And what percentage of level 10 they have completed. So in the, they are about to get to the level 11, because 99% of the points have been received. And if you see in the given and received, that was a pretty good thing that we did. So if someone is only receiving kudos, that's also not good, because they are not actually appreciating other people. So you can see here, there's given is 0, and received is 10. So that also, like in a way, psychologically, that would help. So this is the Slack command, kudos. And then the, on the bottom, you see the model that it opens. You can choose the user. You can write the comment and the activity. So uh, this is how the user would be chosen. These are different activities that are there. So uh, if they completed a security training, they would get 50 points. So the exact points were not mentioned, because then they, people would start trying to give higher points. So we created the certain kind of activity, and then points would be internally correlated. There's a feed of it also, the late, late, latest kudos that people got. And this is the weekly leaderboard that was posted on Slack. So points this week, level, percentage, all those kinds of things. It looked very beautiful. And then there's a link of the button to uh, check the full leaderboard there as well. So what did we achieve from this? So we, the major part was to identify security champions in different teams. For example, let's say I'm, uh, we identify some bugs in the payment team. Now we know exactly whom to reach out to in the payment stream, because that person is already security motivated. So he would be more, uh, like, uh, more receptive to working with us and fixing those issues. So that was the major benefit that we got. So that also accelerated bug fixing. A weekly leaderboard in the company determined that people should be giving kudos and identifying security acts throughout and become more security conscious. Overall, the security awareness was raised, and people 
who were wanting to participate into security events like CTFs and all, they were coming out to us to organize these events because then they would get more points. And we also knew, okay, people are more security conscious now. They are more interested in uh, like doing security events and all. Uh, key takeaways, like I mentioned about gamifying, so that helped us turn the tables. Not totally, but yeah, at least we didn't have to run after devs uh, the way we used to do earlier. Uh, gamifying also, Kudos gave a certain kind of gratification, and because there was a leaderboard, people were keen to get on top of the leaderboard and see their name in the weekly leaderboard section. And we, one of the things that we didn't expect was that there were more people who wanted to come to security and work in security projects than earlier, because earlier we had to chase people to give us developers or give us bandwidth that they can work with us, but now there were a lot of people who wanted to work with us, because it was perceived as a cool thing to do. Uh, where from here now? So we plan to add some tangible gifts out of these uh, points and all. So maybe, like the, as I mentioned, there was the badges, the stickers. Then again, gift cards and all. We also organize uh, CTF events to identify security champions and trainings and all. Uh, I think if you want, you can connect further. And these are the scan we can for the slides. So um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I don't expect, but yeah. The main reason we, we are stuck on this was the management. They didn't want to like easily give out that thing. But yeah, we had these plans because Rippling had a lot of swags and all, so we were doing this. But yeah, that's a good idea. It was harder to have the discussion about, say, a gift card and presented versus uh, money, but it's company pride. So yeah, really that's true. That's true. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, not yet. So I asked the team to open source, but since I've left the company, I don't know when they plan to do it. But okay. yeah, it's very, like, it's not very complicated to build, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Any question? Okay, so the, uh, yeah, I think what you mentioned was that, okay, people who are fixing a P0, P1 usually would be a senior engineer and they would get more points. So that was one of the concerns. and. That's why, like, if you see there are multiple other activities, so even if you identify some security issues or you feel that that's not right, you can report to the security team, and that could be anyone, any fresher also, if they are just seeing that, okay, password is being, or data is being written here to the log. So even that is an identification, and if they identify that to us, we would still give them points. And the points would differ from a person to person, but again, that was, like, how a new person who is new to the org can also contribute to it. Obviously, the people who is fixing P0s and P1s would be rewarded in a higher fashion. But again, to solve that, so there was another concern that was there that people who have accumulated a lot of points early on, they would always be on the top of the leaderboard, and it would be very hard for new people to come up to that. So that's why we created this weekly leaderboard concept that who are the people who moved the leaderboard most in the last one week? So that everyone does a continuous effort instead of just accumulating on points early, because it could be that in a particular sprint, there were a lot of P0s or P1s needed to be fixed. And once those were fixed, the points accumulated for a single person. So weekly leaderboard tried to counter that. And again, yeah, for a new person, yeah, it would take some time, but yeah, they would get to that. I, I get it. So yeah, the reason I also talked about that the business itself is not interested in driving security initiatives. Rather, they would be focused more on uh, building new features and shipping those instead of fixing. So security leaderboard doesn't like solve for that problem. But let's say if you get the management to convince that, OK, these issues need to be fixed, the P0 or P1s need to be fixed, this would help you in finding the right people who would fix that instead of just going around the team, talking to their managers, and getting them fixed. So it won't. It won't help you in prioritizing things, but yeah, at least you would be able to find the right person to fix that. Again, that would be a challenge that would still be there. So almost all the companies that I engage with are usually people who don't have security teams. And infra team or the DevOps team are the people who are slightly more inclined towards security and they understand security more than the developers. 
there's always one or two person in the developer team, like out of the 50, 60 engineers or 100, 200, who would be interested in hacking or something like that in their college, but they couldn't pursue it later because they involved into software. So those are the right people to pick and start getting things. So initially talking with a lot of people helps. And, but yeah, Infra and DevOps team is the one I would say you can start with those. Yeah, ma'am. No, I get it. So, what's your opinion on so we were thinking of adding teams as well because like and that would be like okay the let's say the payment team and then there's let's say uh, other backend teams so we can have collective points so each individual would get points but we can uh, have on their profile what teams they belong and then as a collective graph which team has more secure security focused people and which is higher on the leaderboard so that was one of the ideas to have a collectivism thing and for that also, we also organized a CTF where people were participating as a team. But yeah, that's a good idea that we also thought that we would implement later. I think I get it. I mean, it's hard and a lot of very technical, very nerdy team, they don't usually engage with in these things. And I would say the leader needs to motivate them more uh, from the top down. That's the only way it would be. And if like what he said, if there's a collective team that, okay, your team is not having good enough security push, other teams are like 200, 500 points, we are still zero. That would have a collective sense of them giving kudos to maybe each other or other teams. So as a team, as an individual, they might not give initially, but if they see that their team is lacking as a whole because they are not doing any effort, then they might start working. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Uh, if no one has any questions, uh, you can collect your stickers if you want. I'll keep it here. Thank you.